Hello, welcome to HexCon. My name is Rogan Dawes, and I'm going to be sharing with you what I learned about Keylock remote control systems. I am a researcher for Orange Cyber Defense, and we hack, build, train, scan, and do research. So what is this presentation about? This whole adventure started when my neighborhood decided to apply for permission to close the street entrances. We had automated gates at two of the entrances and wanted to allow residents to open and close them. This would be done using a remote transmitter, much like many have in their homes. This talk covers a few aspects of this journey. Why we chose Keylock, what Keylock actually is and how it works, as well as my experiences obtaining full access to the hardware both receiver and transmitter, as well as repurposing it for use around my home. While it does focus on a particular manufacturer, I won't be revealing the manufacturer key or too much detail about how I was able to find it, as it would expose a significant number of people to attacks, including myself. So, choosing remotes. We wanted transmitters that could be enabled and disabled individually. Having lived in a townhouse complex previously, I was familiar with the flag days where the code on the receiver gets changed because one transmitter has been lost or stolen, and everybody has to come to the gate to get their transmitters updated to the new code. These are rather inconvenient for 26 households. I definitely did not want to try that in an even larger group. We also wanted to have something a bit better than the average gate remote because of smart people like Andrew Mohawk, who demonstrated in 2012 how to snoop and replay fixed code remotes. He managed to, re to decode the bit pattern transmitted and replay arbitrary codes using a cheap transmitter. Not great for a community of 150 households to have to go out and buy a whole new set of remotes when this sort of thing starts getting out. So right off the bat, we wanted something that would be a bit better. Centurion gate motors are pretty much the gold standard for gate motors in South Africa, I think. I'm really not aware of anyone else that has close to the market penetration that Centurion does. We ended up going with the D5 Evo, which was well suited to our requirements. This is quite a smart controller, with time of day settings to open and close the gates, perfect for our access permit conditions. It also has a built-in receiver for remotes, which use the key lock system. Sounds perfect, right? Looking at the documentation, it turns out that the controller is capable of learning up to 500 Nova rolling code remote control buttons. While this may have been feasible to manage the remotes for 150 households directly on the gate controller, and it would start getting tight if each household had more than three remotes, it was not possible to coordinate the configuration between two gates at the top and bottom of the street, and that at the time at any rate. And, it th and then their Super Helix receiver was not yet available. So this is where we ended up, a receiver that can accommodate up to 8,000 enrolled transmitters split across two relays. And then the matter of, of managing the transmitters arose. Since we had two gates, we'd need to enroll the transmitters into both receivers, as well as having backups in case anything happened to the receivers. Fortunately, the vendor provides an app to manage the database, including enrolling transmitters via a USB cable, which was nice. Unfortunately, the app was not exactly designed for mass enrollment, requiring multiple clicks just to enroll a single transmitter on one relay, then scroll through 4,000 entries to get to this corresponding entry for the second relay, and then back again for the next transmitter. Fortunately, the app was written in .NET, making it relatively easy to decompile and figure out how to speak to the receiver and capture the details of the buttons that were being pressed. So I wrote a Java app, because that's what I know. To interface with the receiver and simply increment the slot for each button, alternating between the two relays, dumping the data into the same SQLite database format used by the vendor app. It would then export the database into a text file, which could be saved onto a micro SD card and taken to each gate to be loaded. And so it worked for several years.
So let's talk about Keylock itself. In order for a secure remote control system to be implemented, it's only possible if two conditions are met. A large number of possible combinations must be available, and the system may never respond twice to the same transmitted code. So Keylock was designed with these principles in mind back in the 80s right here in South Africa. It was then purchased by Microchip in the mid-90s and ended up being used in remotes around the world, including many motor car um, manufacturers. The first requirement is achieved by transmitting a 66-bit code word, resulting in a much larger search space than the 10-bit code word that Andrew was able to brute force. The second requirement is achieved by including a 16-bit incrementing counter that is synchronized between the transmitter and the receiver. The receiver will only react if the counter is greater than the last one it's seen, or so a simple re replay attack is foiled. But hold on, you might be thinking. If it's just a single in simple incrementing counter, surely the attacker can also increment the counter and play the next one in the sequence. That attack is prevented by encrypting the counter and some other data using a shared key that is unique to each transmitter, resulting in a 32-bit scrambled block making up part of those previously mentioned 66 bits. So no, it's not truly a 66-bit random space, only 32 bits. The remaining 34 bits have specific meanings and are not random. So the fact that it's reduced from 66 down to 32 bits is less of an issue if you don't have an offline oracle to tell you when you find the right value though and have to actually do the transmission and observe the receiver's actions. The vendor estimated that it would take in the order of billions of years to iterate all, through all the possibilities, making it pretty infeasible to attack using brute force. This is analogous to running Hashcat on a leaked password hash compared to attempting a brute force attack login via the login form of your target. One of the things that they had to consider in their design was desynchronization though. If the transmitter button is pressed outside of the range of the receiver, at some point that counter is going to be uh, larger than the gates counter. So logic was designed to uh, account for this. Generally what happens is that if the received value is within 16 of the, um, of the last value seen by the receiver, it will immediately update uh, its stored value and operate um, its action. If it's more than 16 values away, it will simply store the last value that it's seen temporarily, and then if the very next value that it sees is the next sequence number, it will update the value that is stored for that particular transmitter. And so the synchronization can be restored. Some failure modes of these transmitters? Well, there's two, which is actually um, slightly different to the the more conventional uh, transmitters. In this case, uh, if you can clone yeah, with enough information, you can clone a remote and you can uh, trigger its actions uh, similarly to the legitimate remote. But there's a second uh, failure mode, which is denial of service. If I can convince the, uh, the, the receiver to accept a forged transmission, I can increment that, uh, that counter value beyond the 32,032k um, window and stop the, prevent the original transmitter from functioning at all. So let's talk a bit about the, what the transmissions look like over the air. Transmitters use uh, amplitude shift keying an on-off keying to transmit the 66 bits surrounded by a preamble and a header and ended by a guard period of no transmission. The 
transmitters use varying lengths of um, positives and zero, uh, um, ones and zeros, or should I say highs and lows, uh, to convey a logic zero or a logic one. Those are then combined into a complete transmission, starting with the preamble, the header, the encrypted portion of the transmission being 32 bits, the fixed portion of the transmission being 34 bits, and then the guard time to signal the end of the transmission. Then the breakdown of the encrypted and um, clear text portions, and note that it is back to front because it's transmitted least significant bit first. Um, the encrypted portion contains the synchronization counter, which is a 16-bit value. It contains 10 bits used for discrimination uh, that allows you to verify that you've decrypted the correct portion, um, yeah, the, the correct, how do you say that? that what you have decrypted matches the fixed portion of the transmission. There are two bits for overflows, and then there are the four bits of the buttons that were being pressed. Then in the fixed portion, you've got the serial number of the transmitter being 28 bits, the buttons repeated, which allows you to verify that the transmission, um, the fixed portion and the encrypted portion matches up. Then two bits for statuses, a voltage low and repeat, allow you to determine whether the button has been held down and also whether the battery is about to die. Okay, so the counter is encrypted to prevent it from being uh, tampered with. And this is done using a shared key, a symmetric key, known by both the transmitter and the receiver. How is this key shared between the receiver and the transmitter then? Well, the key lock documentation actually leaves the key derivation function up to the implementer, although there is a reference implementation that appears to be used in practice. There are two forms of learning or enrollment in classic key lock, normal learn and secure learn. In the normal learn process, the key is derived from a combination of a 64-bit manufacturer key, which must be kept completely secret, and the unique 28-bit serial number of the transmitter, used as input into the manufacturer's chosen key derivation function. The same function is used when programming the transmitter to generate a unique key that is written to the write-only memory in the chip, as is used in the receiver to derive the shared key. In this way, the receiver does not need to know the keys of all possible transmitters in advance, but can derive them when needed. Unfortunately, this does mean that the receiver by necessity must contain a copy of the 64-bit manufacturer key, and therefore needs to implement controls to ensure that this key does not leak, or else the entire ecosystem that shares that manufacturer key and key derivation function would be compromised. The problem with the normal learn process is that one of the inputs into the key derivation function is exposed every time the remote is operated because the serial number is included in the transmission. An attacker who knows the manufacturer key and the key derivation function can derive the same encryption key and generate forged transmissions. As a result, Keylock included a secure learn process. In this process, the key is derived from a combination of the 64-bit manufacturer key and a 32-bit random seed used as input into the chosen key derivation function. The random seed is only transmitted when a combination of keys or buttons on the transmitter are pressed. And is only used, uh, and this is only done when enrolling a transmitter onto a receiver. In the normal way of things, the seed is never transmitted. In fact, the transmitters can be programmed that after a few operations, that seed may never be transmitted again. This helps to keep the seed protected. So let's talk about the key derivation functions then. The manufacturer knows the key derivation function 
and the manufacturer key. They use this uh, KDF in the manufacturer key and the transmitter serial number to program the transmitter with a shared key and that serial number. The receiver contains an implementation of the key derivation function as well as the manufacturer key. It receives the transmitter serial number or the seed and from that it can derive the shared key. So the transmitter then will encrypt its counter using that shared key and the receiver can then decrypt that as well. So this is the uh, manufacturer's suggested um, key generation function or key de derivation function based on the serial number um, which is 28 bits so we mask off the top uh, four bits to make sure that the function code is not included and then we decrypt the serial number combined with a six in those first four bits and then we combine that we shift that over 32 bits and combine that with the same process just simply changing the six for a two it's relatively simple and straightforward uh, but as you can see if you do know what that serial number is and the, the manufacturer key then you can derive those shared keys so what attacks have been tried against keylock um, environments or ecosystems one approach has been to perform cryptanalysis and they have found specific weaknesses primarily due to implementation flaws um, their calculations uh, based in 2007 um, were able to reduce the effort to crack a single transmission down to approximately two weeks of fpga assisted calculations not really practical um, depending on um, you know, exactly what it is that you're trying to approach or trying to attack. Um, another approach which has been um, much more effective is to perform side channel attacks. In this way they performed a differential power analysis by monitoring the, the use of or the power use of the receiver or the transmitter um, while it's performing its cryptographic operations they were able to determine what values the keys had um, by looking at the precise power consumption using very um, accurate uh, monitoring systems and in this way they were able to extract the key the unique key from a transmitter or the manufacturer key from the receiver and this is ultimately a complete break however it does require you to um, customize your attack for the particular transmitter well if you attack a single transmitter you get one key and you would need to repeat it for each transmitter um, and then you would need to customize your attack and understand the implementation of the crypto algorithms on each receiver as well as uh, performing it for each um, CPU architecture or implementation for each different manufacturer so depending on um, which CPU family or microprocessor family the vendor is using you may need to um, conduct this attack uh, several times and then in 2015, Sammy Kamkar demonstrated uh, replay attacks, which supposedly should be impossible, but he uh, realized that if he jammed one's transmission while recording it, uh, and you can jam, um, you can allow the first 60 or so bits to be passed through, and then override the last four, which you can um, reconstruct yourself, so you don't need to know what they were then jam and record a second transmission while replaying the first um, and in doing so you would end up with a uh, a single transmission that you could use at a later point 
um, while the user uh, is, you know, has walked away from their car. The problem with this is that it only gets you that single opportunity to reuse your captured transmission and probably a limited window to use it in. Of course, if the user, if you haven't used it by the time the, uh, the, the car or the driver comes back and unlocks their car, um, that captured transmission is immediately invalidated. But there's another attack that you could possibly perform that doesn't rely on differential power analysis or super complex equipment and so on. It doesn't actually require a whole lot of uh, deep technical knowledge either, which is good <laughs> um, in my case. And that attack is to actually extract the firmware from the receiver and reverse engineer it to retrieve that manufacturer key. Now, of course, in most cases, this shouldn't be possible if the vendor has set up their receivers um, properly. In my case, it turns out that they hadn't disabled debugging and it was possible to extract that pro, uh, that firmware. And so uh, I did my, I was able to extract the firmware and um, started learning how to use Ghidra, uh, which has support for bare metal ARM binaries. In this particular case, the CPU in question is a, uh, made by ST Microelectronics and STM32F103. So Ghidra has support for, um, for ARM binaries, um, and so I started out you know, loading it up into Ghidra and trying to make head or tail of what was going on. It was quite a learning curve, um, never having done any reverse engineering at a machine code level before. I decompiled Java, but that's not the same thing at all. Fortunately for me, Ghidra has a mode where it can decompile the machine code into approximate C code, uh, and that certainly made my life a lot easier. One very useful tool, uh, which I found quite helpful, was uh, SVD Loader. What this does is it automates um, the complete generation of peripheral structures and memory maps for microcontrollers. By parsing the system view description files, uh, SVD Loader is able to annotate all the peripherals of the controller, uh, simplifying reverse engineering significantly. And what it does essentially is it translates memory offsets into peripheral names and labels. So for example, you can see that uh, the value dat 4000000 Ord with 0xc, etc., is actually um, part of the Bluetooth controller of the particular chip being used in this example. While it ended up not leading me to the relevant functions, nonetheless, it did make understanding what I was looking at a lot easier. The next approach. Um, was to try following the code based on the strings which were displayed while enrolling a transmitter. Uh, in particular, um, you know, press any key to, to, um, to enroll um, was the, the key, so I tried to follow it by looking at references to the string press and uh, went down a, a rabbit hole and ended up not being able to find it. I think the problem was that the, I ended up down a rabbit hole of display-related code rather than finding anything using the radios. Uh, and I also suspect that the radio-related code was interrupt-based rather than being part of a continuous loop. So even though I was looking potentially in the right place, uh, I ended up not finding it this way. <laughs> 
Then I ran into <clears throat> a blog post by a guy named David Lodge, um, Tips for Reverse Engineering Crypto Code. And this was invaluable to me, although it did take me down some unproductive rabbit holes initially. So always looking for strings and constants. Strings didn't help me, but looking for constants absolutely did. Um, make guesses about the original source, or if you can find it, find you know look for the actual source code. The good news is that the source code for the keylock algorithms have actually been leaked on the internet. It is supposedly protected by non-disclosure agreements, but you can find it out there. And there are a number of independent implementations of those crypto algorithms. So that helps you to um, avoid making those guesses. Although it still doesn't entirely help you um, know exactly what is in the, the firmware. Um, <clears throat> so I ended up looking for constants in the algorithms that I found online, and that did take me down a number of rabbit holes. The constants that I was looking for simply didn't exist in the firmware at all. Um, and so that left me scratching my head. Uh, it turned out that because there are multiple implementations of the keylock algorithm, I was looking at a rather more refined version than the original manufacturer code. And uh, as a result, the, the constants that I was looking for simply weren't present. The constants in the manufacturer provided code were present and those quickly led me to the relevant functions. So I'm not going to go, as I mentioned, I'm not going to go through the details of exactly how I found the manufacturer key because it's still in wide use and there is no plan from the vendor on how to rotate it. I can imagine that this is a particularly complex problem. They've sold thousands of these remotes and receivers out into South Africa and uh, out into Africa as well. And um, well, they don't actually have any way of getting hold of them as well as uh, reprogramming all of them would be an incredibly um, complicated task. So suffice to say, if a noob like me can find it, it was not too well protected. So decoding the keylock code word, um, I first wanted to make sure that I could decode the incoming transmissions from the radio chip using my PC before trying to implement the algorithm in C in a microcontroller. It just is a much more friendly development environment. And so what I did was I used a, um, a cheap logic analyzer to tap the line between the RF decoder chip on the receiver board and the microprocessor. And after much trial and error, I was able to isolate the, isolate the actual transmissions from the surrounding noise and start trying to decode them. I used the SIGROT project's PulseView UI to look at the results. Now, there was no keylock decoder um, implemented, and so um, I had to implement my own. Initially, I was trying to decode uh, an entirely incorrect portion of the capture. I finally managed to correlate the transmissions by soldering a wire to the transmitter button and monitoring that line at the same time as the radio receiver. By focusing on the portion where the line was high, I was able to identify the actual transmission and start trying to decode it. Eventually, I had a Python decoder implemented that gave me the same results as the original vendor firmwares for a specified transmission. And this will be open source when I get around to submitting a pull request and shepherding it through the process. As you can see, um, the individual nibbles can be uh, extracted. Uh, 0, E, C, 8, etc. But then those need to be read backwards because it is transmitted least significant bit first. Uh, and then uh, you can see the serial number and then the button that was being transmitted. 
or the buttons that were being pressed. So that corresponds fairly closely to the diagram provided in the data sheet. Once I had a working decoder, I then had to try and figure out how I was going to implement this on the hardware. I went down an initial rabbit hole uh, looking at libopencm3, which is a uh, firmware environment for a number of ARM-based microprocessors. Um, while it does provide a bunch of drivers and a whole lot of you know, useful peripheral drivers, um, it would still have been quite an onerous process to re-implement based, you know, all of the functionality that I wanted uh, for, um, for managing the, the remote receiver as well as the relays and the buttons, etc., that existed on the existing hardware, uh, as well as things like over-the-air updates and such like. And so I came across a project called ESP Home, which is a system to control ESP8266 and ESP32 microprocessors um, using simple configuration files. Um, ESP8266 and ESP32 are microprocessors that have got built-in Wi-Fi interfaces. And so you can interface with these uh, from the rest of your Wi-Fi network. Um, however, uh, so this looked rather attractive, um, but unfortunately, this is a very different beast to the STM32 F103 ARM-based microcontroller on the complex receiver that I had. Fortunately, there is an Arduino implementation for the STM32 family of chips. And with a little bit of work, I managed to get ESP Home running natively on the STM32 and on that complex receiver board. One reason I think that this was a good decision is that ESP Home actually has built-in support for transmitting and receiving infrared and RF remote control signals. And this ended up saving me quite a lot of time. While Keylock was not amongst those um, implemented, actually implementing the decoder was a relatively simple matter using the existing implementations as a guideline. And as you can see, it only needed a fairly small amount of code to get ESP Home running on the STM32. And a bit more code to implement the Keylock protocol, to, um, to implement the encryption algorithms, and then finally to implement a programming algorithm for the Keylock transmitters that I had. And what this allows me to do is actually program a duplicate transmitter with my chosen serial number and derived key, as well as choosing the starting uh, replay counter value. So a quick demonstration of what the um, the ESP home system looks like. This is just looking um, at the serial output, um, the logs from the ESP home firmware running directly on the STM32 based complex receiver board. The orange block is purely to focus your attention on the important details. So you can see a text sensor being updated, both as the built in button repeat occurs um, and is cleared as well as when further buttons are pressed. In the leftmost colon separated field is the serial number, then the button which is being pressed, followed by the counter value, and two status bits, battery low and repeat. So there's the serial number, the button, the counter value, which you can see incrementing A, B, C, and D, and then the two status bits. As you saw 
In the previous demonstration, it was possible to observe the transmissions picked up by the complex receiver using the USB serial port. Of course, that then requires a PC to be powered up and an additional program written to translate those serial output into Home Assistant sensor states. I decided that I wanted to have it as self-contained as possible and using as little, po little power as possible. So this brings me back around to the ESP, uh, to ESP Home. Um, I happen to have an ESP32 dev board, a development board, handy, um, which brings us back into supported territory in ESP Home. The complex receiver board originally had a display board attached via the double row header between the program header and the mounting holes over here. The pins available on the header included power and ground and fortunately also included a serial port. The remaining question was what is the best way to take the ESP home entities things like switches, sensors, the key lock receiver etc and expose those to an external client? Well, ESP home already had an API defined for connections made over TCP connections from Home Assistant using Google Protobufs. I figured it would be a relatively straightforward solution to implement the same protocol over a serial port and then write a client implementation that would map remote entities on the STM32 into the local ESP Home instance on the ESP32. In this way, updates from the STM32 would be sent to the ESP32 and forwarded on to Home Assistant, and instructions from Home Assistant, for example, to activate a relay, would be sent to the ESP32 and then forwarded on to the STM32. And finally, Home Assistant also has a predefined inter interface for RFID tags, which essentially presents a string representation of the tag ID. This sounded quite similar to what we're dealing with with the key lock um, transmitters. And so, uh, a few hundred lines of code later, I had a client interface, um, a client API implementation. Uh, well, it's incomplete because I only implemented the sensors and other entities that I actually needed for this project. So things like covers, garage doors and blinds and so forth are not supported, for example. So here is a demonstration showing the Home Assistant receiving transmissions from, um, from the receiver. If you look on to the right, you can see the button incrementing as well as the counter incrementing. And then if we go to the RFID tag interface, we can see a similar approach. You can see the serial number and the button without the counter. The counter value was removed simply to make it um, easier to map a constant value rather than a constantly changing value to actions in Home Assistant. This is the, the logic that is followed. Um, this is a, a snippet actually of the configuration file for the STM32 version of Home Assistant, uh, of ESP Home. Um, the, trans the remote receiver calls the on key lock function with a value um, representing the, the, uh, the decoded fixed and hopping portions of the of the transmission. So if the key lock decryptor, i.e. the implementation of the, the crypto algorithms, uh, can decrypt the transmission, then format the details, the serial number, the button, the counter, and the various flags into a buffer, and send those to, um, to Home Assistant. <coughs> 
This is an example of the configuration of the HTS301 transmitter and a script to program one with a specified serial number and key using the normal keygen key derivation function and a serial number of zero. In this case, I'm programming serial number of DA342B um, with an initial sequence number of zero. So some outstanding features. Um, I haven't yet implemented persistent recording of counters and replay detection. Um, that needs an implementation of a storage API for the SPI EEPROM, which is already on the board. Um, I've done the design of the storage format, which will support um, 4096 transmitters with up to 14 functions each, as well as logging of up to 8000 events within the EEPROM. The current manufacturer firmware uh, will only log to an SD card, which is not necessarily a problem, but it is an additional uh, component. In addition, the, um, the client API and the server occasionally get desynchronized. Um, and at the moment, that does not recover gracefully. So I need to, to fix that. Um, before this could be a robust uh, deployed um, setup. And then um, enhancements to the client API to implement um, the remaining entity types that I haven't yet implemented. And then finally, uh, there is a problem with the HCS301 um, transmitter uh, algorithm. And I'm not so sure whether it's a problem with the algorithm or not because I've confirmed that the value which gets programmed um, is in fact um, received by the transmitter because you can read back the value during the programming sequence. Uh, you simply can't ever read it again after that. Um, so the problem that I've encountered is that trying to program an initial sequence number um, greater than about 60 or so ends up with a corrupted value. And so the value that you've programmed is not the next value used when starting a transmission. Um, I suspect that this might actually be broken silicon. Uh, I'm pretty sure that 99.99% of vendors simply program a sequence number starting at zero uh, and have never encountered this bug. Um, but yeah, that is something that I'd really like to try and solve because um, without it, it's a bit more difficult to actually transmit or to create a forged um, transmitter. So the code for this is available in my ESP home fork. There are three branches, the code for the STM32, the code for the key lock and the API client. Um, if you want to try and replicate my work in your own environment using a complex receiver, you'll probably want to merge those three branches together um, in order to, to have it all function on that STM32. Um, they were created separately because they are pretty much independent pieces of work uh, and the Keylock and API client work does not depend on the STM32 uh, or they're, they're completely independent, in fact. So that is the summary of my journey through a, uh, the Keylock environment. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming along on this journey with me. And if you have any questions, I will be in the chat for, um, for a while so that, um, so that I can answer them. Thank you very much.